Welcome to the Phase World Podcast, engaging conversations that cross the boundaries between business, art, and the digital world. could take care of all the artists but you have to be an entrepreneur for sure and you have to pay with passion and uh, you just gotta love what you do otherwise I'd start doing something else still my creativity but with the right partners it gets to the right playlist it's a difference of millions of plays on Spotify it's quite hard to get everything in place to have it perfect to have it be success It can be arranged. For me, it's creating a really, a lot of output. Try to make the best product every time. Now I also write, taking into account the label, the DJs, the audience, but still not losing my own authenticity. I just, I need to be myself, but I also can just be myself. You can find your way. You just have to be open for a lot of things and thinking solutions. But it's about changing perspectives, really. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Phase World Podcast. I am your host, Fei Wu. Today, I have Ai Ming Wei on the show with me as a guest. Ming is a singer and songwriter, formerly known as Ming's Pretty Heroes. Minga is the New Deal. About two years ago, she signed a record release with EDX, and she collaborates with musicians such as Mike Candies, Matteo Koss, and always working on more things and writing more songs. Originally from Rotterdam and Holland, we crossed paths at Freiburg Academy in Freiburg, Maine. Imagine that. I remember her as a fearless 15-year-old Dutch singer among dozens of international students who came to the U.S. with at least a few others, Ming was the only one from Holland, yet she quickly made a name for herself, singing in English in front of 600-plus American kids. I thought it was ballsy, which makes her a perfect candidate for Face World Podcast, a collection of my mentors and friends who, without an exception, use bravery, insights, creativity to challenge the status quo, to make a life of their own. Ming and I had a lot to catch up on because it had been 16 years since I last spoke with her. After spending just nine months at Freiburg before returning to Rotterdam, Ming didn't give up on music. Instead, she continued to take lessons in piano, singing, and eventually majored in music in college. If any of you are listening to this, From Freiburg, a big shout out to our beloved high school that truly enabled Ming's career in a very significant way. Way before we had Facebook Live and other live broadcasting software at our fingertips, Ming was doing all of that on her own with her bands and putting videos out on Facebook and YouTube, often without background music. What's that called again? Um, A cappella? And sometimes she plays the piano while singing her songs. In her own words, she wrote a lot of songs and was always in the creative process. Someone who recently started pursuing a creative process, I can tell you firsthand that it's much easier said than done. No joke. Some days can be quite painful. I couldn't let go an opportunity to ask Ming about her creative process, how she records her album, how she releases them into the ether, working with her band and producer, We also dove into details of music as a business, just like every other business. Ming learned how to navigate around it, no easy task. Her songs, Riverbank now has over 6 million downloads on Spotify, alongside a few other popular ones such as Make Believe, Bigger Than This, and Ming writes her music in English rather than Dutch. You will learn a few interesting things about the music business overall and how it works in Europe. If you like this episode, please consider subscribing to the Face World podcast. It takes seconds, I promise. You can do this easily via the podcast app on your iPhone or an Android app such as Podcast Addict. 
one of the best gifts I could ever ask for this holiday season is if you could consider writing us a quick review on iTunes. Faye's interviews with her podcast guests go deeper than just their professional successes. Topics include hidden origin stories, counterintuitive learnings, and personal motivations that help to humanize guests in a way many other interview-style podcasts do not. The episodes can serve as a way to inspire you to overcome some hardships in your life, or they can just help you appreciate the winding path we take over the course of our lives. Thank you so much for spending your precious time with us. Without further ado, please welcome I Ming Wei to Face World Podcast. I remember meeting you for the first time at Freiburg uh, at this point 16 years ago. Let's not exaggerate to be 17. Yeah, 2000. And 2000. Yeah. I saw you, I'm not sure if you remember, but you were at the student club. There was kind of a, like a basement area where all the international students came together. And mm-hmm. I remember you were, you got up, I remember you were walking through the crowd and everybody turned their heads, right? <laughs> But I know that one thing I one thing I hear from people all the time are, and then there's part of my own observation is, um, you're clearly very beautiful, yet you've never really made it your trademark as to you know something that you talked about where you took advantage of, and mm. you know from my own observation, what I was really impressed about is back then at a young age of 15. That's I think that's how old you were because I was 17. Mm-hmm. And, and you were singing, right? You were, I think you were one of the very few people, perhaps the only person from Amsterdam or Holland in this Holland, case. Holland, yeah. You were, the only, you were the only kid, yet you clearly quickly drew a following of, you know, new friends. They're almost like family to you. And you were getting up on stage at a private school in the U.S., in the middle of nowhere in Maine, Freiburg Academy, I'm sure it will come up, and you're getting up on stage and singing that was just something I'll never forget, you know? Mm -hmm. I think in many ways, it kind of changed my world to say, wow, it's really really daunting to be young and to be in a foreign country. And yet you're out there singing. Maybe because you were two years older, you had a different experience. But to me, maybe I seemed fearless. I was fearless, but I was more naive. I had the perfect personality to just step into this new world and see what's out there. And, oh, hey, there's a lot of music. Love this. There's a lot of theater. Love it. You and, never, uh, you weren't scared at all when you were even, no. wow. I don't know why. You know what did happen, though? Because this is a sign of that I was quite young and maybe a bit naive still, was that I kept getting lost. And you remember how small the building was. But you could go into the right wing or the left wing, and then there was history somewhere down there. And I just... I just couldn't remember where it was. <laughs> I just kept getting lost. I'm like, wait, this is the football field. No, no, I have to go here. This is the student union. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess like part of the lightness I could, there was for me in, in like searching new, new, searching out new friends. It was also, uh, I don't know, I wasn't really thinking. <laughs> 15. 15 is interesting. <laughs> I recently interviewed this uh, teacher who is uh, in her 80s and she's been the teacher her mm. entire life. And she told me, uh, being a high school teacher, her favorite class or grade or age would be 10th graders in the U.S., which translates to exactly 15. And, you know, she said that's an age where you're fearless and you're a little bit naive and you're just discovering who you are as a person. So Mm -hmm. I feel very lucky to kind of have witnessed, met you at that time for only nine months. You know, I was witnessing exactly that phase of your life. Um, yeah, you were. Mm. I, I remember this particular thing that uh, I was 15, so sophomore year, and I was only there for a year. So it was definitely sort of a party awesome <laughs> super year for me. <laughs> and I remember there being other sophomores saying, oh, but you seem older. You seem like you're a senior. You seem like you're 18. And then I started thinking, like, maybe this is just a difference between the Netherlands and America at the time. Because I, I also know that in America, they have one level of schooling for everyone. And in Holland, it's already divided up. So there are several, several levels. And I guess um, this has a different effect on people. I mean, in the end, we'll all end up at the same station, I'm pretty sure. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're stage. right. 
Yeah. You were right about the maturity level, I think, with the, some mm. of the European students, as I was roommate with one of them. Who, uh, oh, yeah. I'm glad you're friends with her because you came in and visit a lot. I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think we, I remember the exchange we had briefly about the difference between speaking, you know, Dutch versus German. You said you could actually understand some percentage of that fairly easily. So. Yeah, but I had it in school, huh? so it's a oh, yeah, you did unfair it. competition. I couldn't understand Chinese. <laughs> you couldn't? No. I remember with. <laughs> That's one thing I feel really proud of. Like after you became a superstar in school and then I found out that you're half Chinese. And in first, for a second, we're really puzzled because we just hadn't guessed that at all. As you remember, there were a number of Chinese students there. Yeah. <laughs> all right. And then, and then your dad showed up at the academy like a few months later and I tried to speak Chinese to him. And I really- <laughs> you did? And then I realized he was, he was so confused. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I just assumed that you did. <laughs> and you explained to me. Uh, uh, yeah. oh, I didn't know that. That's really funny. Yeah. yeah. He was so friendly. I remember exactly which door he came in and like, and your brother was there too. <laughs> This is very special because I'm really impressed by what you have accomplished because part of me wasn't, I think part of us at Freiburg wasn't sure if you were just 15, and that's maybe something as a singer, as a dancer, that's something you wanted to do for that mm -hmm. period of your life. Or is it something that you want to pursue very seriously moving forward? So it certainly is the second path that you've chosen because you've studied music in college. Mm -hmm. And then since then, you know, for over 10 years, you've been a professional full-time performing artist. So tell me a little bit about start me off with what I have missed for over 10 years. And I'm going to jump in and maybe interrupt you to ask some more questions. <laughs> all right. Well, first of all, actually, the, the Academy, Fabric Academy, it had a big role in my career decision because high schools in America, they have a lot more uh, attention for music and, and you can go to competitions several times a year. And in Holland, that would never be possible because academics are, are so important that <laughs> you're not allowed to leave school for anything. <laughs> so um, this was already a big difference. And I got encouraged by the people there, by people like you and by the music director. So I had fun. So when I came back to Holland, I still had three more years of high school left. So yeah, that was regular school. But next to that, I just continued taking lessons, singing, piano, and I also still dance a lot. I always used to dance. And um, yeah, I just had to wait till I graduated from high school and I could start auditioning for music schools. And so I did. And I ended up starting my preliminary year in Rotterdam, which is my hometown. So uh, this is where I ended up also. And that was like half working in the restaurant and half going to school. And after that, I, you had to audition again. And I got in and there was four years of uh, school left. But I, I studied pop music. So uh, my major was singing. And uh, later on, I did a minor of songwriting and, and uh, home recording, music computers, home recording, something like that. Wow. And then, yeah, so that's the school part. But the good thing is that while you're in school, you already have to start living your professional life. Otherwise, I mean, it's, it's really based on that, the school part. So while I was in school, I discovered I had a knack for songwriting I loved it. And I, I, I already really loved the English language, of course, uh, because of going to America. So, yeah, I started writing. And then this is just who I am and how a lot of people are, I think, that once you do something, you're going to finish it. And then you're going to say, what can I do with it next? So then I'm going to I release an EP and I did a lot of concerts and I just started working towards more and more and more. So I had an EP out halfway But uh, I graduated finally from um, conservatory here with my first album. So I had an album release party, so a big concert, and that was my uh, graduation. And What then was I called? was ready for the world. Oh, the the uh, album? Yeah, back then. What yeah. was it called? Yeah. Uh, okay, Mr. Mix. Wow. Where and did that come the, from? Yeah, that was... Um, I used to listen to a song a lot, and that started with, okay, Mr. Mix. And I just really loved the song. And I uh, and it was also sort of a, a tribute to the engineer and mixer I worked with in the studio because we had such a great time. Oh, wow. Incredible. That's a long time ago already. In 2009, I think. You got to start somewhere, which is uh, really interesting because... I want to kind of come back to the fact that you like to write English songs. And by the way, mm -hmm. is that 
normal because remember that one day I was in Amsterdam. That one day I was there, I couldn't find internet with my girlfriend traveling. <laughs> and I yeah. finally was able to text you from Facebook and found out that one day you were in Beijing. I was in Beijing then? Yes. Oh. <laughs> I was standing in Amsterdam. I, you know, my um, my friend Pam and I took a trip and uh, we were traveling in Europe for three weeks. And then yeah. I was in Amsterdam for one day. I'm not even sure if you were there where the distance between that and Rotterdam, I wasn't thinking. It's quite close. I could have made it. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. quite close. Yeah. And uh, I found out you're performing in Beijing. And mm -hmm. I remember watching you on stage and oh my God. I mean, since we're onto that now, I was looking for you. Then I found uh, your performance and there, to me, there were just thousands of Chinese people, you mm -hmm. know, watching you on stage. I believe it was uh, like an outdoor stadium. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about how were you invited to Beijing that somehow I missed you yeah. and what was it like? First of all, it was awesome. <laughs> so this is a few years ago. I met Chung Yu through a friend or something. And he, he, he's a musician he, who started up a music school in Beijing, but he was traveling in Europe. So he was in Holland. And somehow I got his email and I just emailed him, hello, <laughs> uh, do you need any artists for your festival? I, I heard there was going to be a festival called MIDI Festival. And he said, yeah, yeah, we really like your music. We want to book you. And then uh, here in Holland, you have uh, you can apply for a subsidy, a tour subsidy. So you have to have three shows before you can apply and, and uh, receive money to buy plane tickets and stuff. So uh, he arranged a few more shows for me. And that's the first time we went. And then the festival turned out to be super crazy and big. And we played for 7,000 people. So this was the biggest show I'd ever played. <laughs> wow. Was uh, Did you mention that you're half Chinese? And did you I already... did because I, I already found out the effect that it was... <laughs> Whenever I said to mention that I was hatching, he'd be like, oh, I'm more interested now in who you are. Exactly. It's like, well, yeah. thanks for bringing that up. But it, it wasn't all fake, though, because I, I really, really liked China and um, I loved playing there. I could go back there again and again and again. Yeah, anytime. That's amazing. Yeah. And I must say that it's so, I stopped thinking about what it would be like to kind of be a broadcaster, or be a singer in China. And mm -hmm. one, I would encourage, highly encourage you to take every opportunity to go back there. Maybe there's something that we will continue talking about it offline as my mom has built her reputation <laughs> as an artist and she's really yeah. into exchange programs. And But secondly, I because a lot of my podcast is in English, it didn't make sense for me to kind of upload aggressively to say like some Chinese podcasting networks just because mm -hmm. people's comfort zone is still listening to Chinese podcasts. But believe it or not, once I interviewed one, my mom and I interviewed Pam, who actually went to Amsterdam with me, I interviewed those two mm -hmm. just out of, you know, it was really interesting. But after I uploaded those to the Chinese network, the next morning I woke up and there were 900, 1,000 downloads, which is awesome. <laughs> literally overnight. But, you know, so jumping around quite a bit, do you think like, do you think singing in English and writing in English is quite common in, I'm trying to say Amsterdam or Holland in general? Do you think that's common or are you kind of unique in that way? No, no, it's very common because uh, Holland is a very small country. So we have always watched TV with subtitles. So we've always been around English. And also because we are such a small country, our radio stations tend to just play a lot of American and, and British music and not a lot of our Dutch music. I guess somehow we all choose to write in English and this is good in a lot of ways, but also, yeah, there are a lot of bad lyrics out there as well. <laughs> so interesting. there's good and a bad side. You know, it's interesting because you've always been fluent. I've met, you know, I met you when you were 15 and your English was fluent. I think part of that also, I can't get over the fact that kids growing up in Europe can speak five, six, seven different languages. And the smaller the country, the more languages they can speak somehow. I mean, what was it like? Uh, I guess it's a loaded question. How did you study English in comparison to other languages, such, you know, such as German, your own language and uh, mm. everything else? Well, if I think back to school, like German and French and Latin, we really had to like study and, and do the exercises and <laughs> to learn. But for English, yeah, it's it's all around you. It's everywhere here in Holland. So it's to a lot of people, it comes quite naturally. But, you know, <laughs> your English was really great. <laughs> I was there as well. I remember because I remember of all the Chinese people there 
you were actually the only one who could uh, oh, thank you. use already very fluently. And uh, for me, I've been away for so long that I kind of lost some of the fluency. I have to come back and stay there for like a week and then I'll be ready again. But um, but yeah, it comes back. Depends. Like whenever I talk to American people for like half an hour, I find myself to be fluent again. But sometimes not. <laughs> it really depends. But it's in here <laughs> somewhere. Do you come back? Often, yeah. I think you were in New York a couple of times. Yeah, just once, actually. So that's already a while ago. And I saw some people from school and uh, I stayed there for three weeks because I, I really felt like I just wanted to jump in and, and yeah, stay there and hang out with people and go to house parties and not not just be tourists again. That's incredible. Yeah, but it's fun. Yeah, I should go back. Should yeah. come back. Again. More <laughs> reasons to do that. So, yeah. Um, Step off the train. I'm walking down your street again Past your door But you don't live there anymore It's here since you've been there Now you've disappeared somewhere Like out of space You found some better place And I miss you I think music, like the way I think about music, and I'm so glad to be able to invite more musicians onto my podcast. Um, I have already I've interviewed classical musicians. I have interviewed Ralph Peterson Jr., who's a drummer and, mm -hmm. you know, one of the greatest ones alive and talks about drug addiction. And he, he really went in very deep. And he's like, <laughs> can you handle this? I can tell you everything. So mm -hmm. just really happy about that. But I also think as a secondhand influencer by, you know, because someone who is influenced by music in watching mm -hmm. you perform, it's, it's really true. It's uh, music is without boundaries in a way, you know, a boundary as to language and nationality. Mm. What's really intriguing to me about your music is going from Ming's Pretty Heroes to, mm -hmm. I don't know how recent it's been, uh, maybe in the past year, a couple of years or so. Is it Ming? How do you say? Ming. Uh, I say Ming. Ming. Okay. What does that mean? What? Why was the change? And then what does Ming mean? Well, first of all, yeah, first I had Ming's Pretty Heroes and I uh, did, th I made three albums and I did a lot of, so I went to China twice and I did all kinds of cool stuff in between, but it was all independently. So I did some crowdfunding. I won a prize. I, I this is how I financed my products and um, all these things. And then about a year and a half ago, or maybe two years now, some music publishers started calling, asking, "What's up?" <laughs> and I was like, "Music publishers? What? What do they do? Can they like put my music in Grey's Anatomy? Because that's my dream, of course." <laughs> <laughs> and um, Yeah, it was fun, but we had to start dating this music publisher and I because I didn't really know what was going on. And, and you know, so we said, okay, let's do a trial period. And I uh, started doing that and I found out that it's, yeah, it, it's about the music I already made, but it's also a lot about songwriting. So writing songs for yourself, for someone else, for doesn't matter. And then this happened to one with one publisher and another one and a third one. The third one, actually, he saw me for the first time when I was actually singing a tribute to Kate Bush. So I wasn't even singing my own songs at that time. <laughs> But he, he was intrigued by my voice and he, he called us up and uh, us, me and my management, he called us up and said, so would you be interested to, you know, have a talk? So I started another, yet another trial period. Well, this one was more in the dance music, electronic music scene. They are a, a, a smaller part of spinning records. And spinning records is uh, the biggest dance label at the moment. Dance music uh, originates from Holland or maybe not originates, but it's oh, most of it is from here at the moment. <laughs> I'm sure it's changing. So uh, I started going to writing camps and setting up sessions with other songwriters or other uh, producers and then somehow the yeah the genre changed a bit yeah i so noticed that more, too yeah more from indie songwriterish uh, pop music it was still pop music but more modern uh, so more dance and electronic and uh, i started writing more and more every day with more people and and i had my first releases 
uh, of songs that I wrote, but I didn't sing for a national, a Dutch national star. And then I thought, yeah, this is interesting. Also because the three albums were done independently it was very awesome, but I could, I could feel we were hitting a ceiling uh, because it's either you, you push through and get in the big, get to play with the big boys or you can stay in and work hard independently, but it's, it's too hard. Yeah, um, let's talk about that for a second because I remember a few years ago, it's so funny, you mentioned two years ago, you, you're kind of transitioning into the a different genre and going from independent to now having a, a record label, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, at the very time I was starting this podcast and uh, I immediately reached out to a close network of family and friends and uh, advertising the podcast and hoping to mm-hmm. invite them on board. And then at the very time I reached out to you and you're very busy uh, managing all all these changes. And one of mm-hmm. the things that you had said was uh, being an independent musician is very challenging. So right now, your life, your kind of music life is divided into two parts, kind of the before and after the label, mm-hmm. I'm sure. Each face is without, you know, with certain constraints and challenges. But let's talk about the first part when you were still mm-hmm. Ming's Pretty Heroes. Because I mentioned this briefly, half of my family are musicians. I know just intimately some of the challenges they have to go through. And what was it like for you back then? You know, how did you finance that endeavor? Because you really have to take serious credits for the fact that you did that for so many years before the record label even became a possibility, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, I've always uh, had two teaching days a week. (laughs) So this is my, my first bit of income that was always certain. You just need, yeah, to finance it, you need extra money once you start going to, into recording. So when you have to rent out the studio, have to uh, rent a rehearsal space, all these things. So the first time I, uh, we have some sort of uh, financial plan in Holland that students, actually they, they stopped it now, but back then we would receive uh, a little bit of money extra month just mm-hmm. uh, sort of to finance our studies or to help the students. And uh, you could sign up to loan extra money. <laughs> so I did. I like I took in extra money and I spent it on my first CD. <laughs> so those are a little bit of my student loans. And the second one, I won a big prize. It was uh, 15,000 euros. Totally unexpected. But once I won it, I could put this right into my second album. So How did you win the- that? What was the competition? Um, well, it was music, yeah. So first you had to be nominated. It was called the Music Matters Award, and it's it was for Rotterdam, so the city I'm from, and it was all about becoming the music ambassador for the next year, and also this prize of 15,000 euros. And, I don't know, competitions, I don't always like it, but I, I decided to enter because I was nominated in like 15,000 euros. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> Do it and again. then so, somehow we won. Yeah, we just had to play one song where we had just finished a, a three week tour in Germany. So we're very in our game at that time. We just came back and then we entered the competition and, and we won. So this is how I could finance the second album. Uh, so the artwork, the mixing, the recording, the mastering, the traveling costs, the food, all these things. Uh, video, music video. And, um, the third one was like, yeah, so how am I going to finance this? Because, yeah, you do play and I do earn money while I, I play gigs or I do earn some money for my author's rights and all these things. But it's never enough at the right time to finance a whole album. So I started uh, to do a crowdfunding and through family, friends, fans. Yeah, I gathered enough money to do a third album. What is enough, by the way? Like, I, I don't know how that translates to U.S. versus... Holland, yeah. approximately how much for an album? The bare minimum versus like do or write. Because we're never, you know how life works. You're never going to yeah. have the perfect no, it's outcome. A, it's, a, it's a difficult question because you uh, the money you will spend on paying people to do your mixing, your recording, your renting space, that, that may be like 8,000 euros or something if you need a space to, to record with your band. Because right now, if you do electronic music, you can do a lot on your computer, but that's for the next step. And... Um, but then there's promotion and videos and that's extra couple of thousand. So once you add it up, I think 15 back then, 15,000 euros was enough, but I couldn't pay me, my, my, I couldn't pay myself or my band uh, members. So, or maybe I paid them a little bit, but I, so this is not right. I think also with the crowdfunding, I uh, gathered the money, but I couldn't pay the actual musicians so much at all. It's more, it's expenses. 
So this is something also I wanted to change. Like whenever I have a gig, I have a show, I want to be able to pay my musicians well. And also I need to eat. So I also need to make money. So this is also part of the the new transition that we're that we're about to talk. This is so fascinating. This is incredibly fascinating to me because, you know, when you it's like when you have a conversation with your close friends and you open up about issues, let's just say family or non-family related or work related, all of a sudden you have this light bulb at the top of your head. It's like, wow, I'm not alone in this. It's incredible because all the people I've spoken with who are now, some people are, some people are considered to be incredibly successful today, were mm-hmm. telling me back then, you know, use an example as uh, I love, you might not have heard of her, but Krista Tibbet is in NPR and now she runs the top 50, top 20 podcast called On Being. So she is Mm -hmm. tier one. And she was telling me when she started this endeavor, she was a grown up back then. She wasn't just out of college, I guess maybe in her 30s at the time, around Mm -hmm. 2000. Nobody believed in the message. And she was up in the recording studio by herself and blew my mind, you know, like she had a family. So I guess it's a long way of saying like this very entrepreneurial approach to music, to a lot of the artists I interview are really common because it's not so much of right or wrong, but people who believe in you and believe in what you're trying to do. Like a lot of people from high school, but I know that you've expanded much above and beyond that network. It's really worth it. You know, I don't think it's wrong. And I do think there needs to be a way to kind of better take care of uh, musicians and artists in the world. And that's something that I, by the way, just throw it out. That's something I'm really keenly aware of. And I'm trying to kind of help artists kind of bridge artists of any kind, like yourself, like my mom, to kind of bridge that gap to commerce as well. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, I mean, it would be amazing if we could take care of all the artists. But yeah, it's the truth that you have to be an entrepreneur for sure. And you have to pay with passion and uh, you just got to love what you do. Otherwise, I'd start doing something else. (laughs) If I start selling an actual product that would actually make money, I'd be really great, I think. (laughs) But, you know, I'd start, yeah, decide to do music and Yes, I have already experienced a change and I've sought out partners to partner up with, so labels or publishers, and this makes all the difference, which is sad in a way because my music is still my music and I still play the same, you know, it's still my creativity, but with the right partners, it gets to the right playlists or, you know, it, it's a difference of millions of, of plays on Spotify. And weirdly, yeah, I've done things differently, but not like a lot differently. So let's talk yeah, very, very much so. And that's why I, I wanted to hear sort of the, I think, when I think about Ming's Pretty Heroes, that was your origin story. What you mm-hmm. started off, you're this baby and it kind of, you kind of mature and breaking out of the shell, you know? Mm-hmm. And then most recently, and I was surprised to see the song, I believe it's called The Riverbank, got received mm-hmm. over 5 million downloads on Spotify. And then kind of in conjunction to what you just mentioned, could you give me some ideas? Uh, me, also some of the listeners, I'm sure you have some musicians and like even kids in college to say, how do I break into this world? And what are some of the moments you're like, wow, I made it to the right playlist where this person yeah. introduced yeah. me to something I didn't know before? Well, I guess the whole uh, history of making three albums independently was necessary <laughs> for people to start noticing me and to, you know, the the music industry might have known who I was, but I was not really released to the audience enough. But then, yeah, the music industry later on somehow found me and I I signed my publishing deal and and I just got to step into this whole new network and I was suddenly close to the fire. I was close to producers who were already doing well and, and for me, suddenly it was possible to have collaborations with these DJs. And of course, one collaboration doesn't mean it's a hit. It's going to be played millions. There's still a lot of puzzle pieces that have to like fall into place. But um, well, this is it. I'm close to the fire. And I, yeah, there's one song on Spotify you can actually see on my name. And I think it's about six or seven million already. So it keeps on counting. But I also have other releases in one year as a featuring artist. So Spotify still doesn't really put that into, doesn't categorize it under my name. It categorizes it under the DJ's name. Yeah, I saw that. Artist. Yeah. But yeah, you can really see the difference between the releases that were priority releases. They have millions of plays. And the ones who were, you know, just releases and they have more like, 
hundred thousands of plays. So still way, way more than I ever had before. But you can see the difference, the promotion tools uh, they use for the one release or for the other. Yeah, it just is a big influence. So I'm intrigued by Spotify since I came to realize Spotify, I think it was around 2012 or 13, around that time. And then since then, I've heard slightly mixed feedback for how it's making musicians money, how it's not mm-hmm. doing that at all, uh, mm-hmm. it's making them broke. And uh, But <laughs> most recently, you know, I know th- the band also kind of in a, how do I say, kind of up and coming called 8090. And then they had a song trending towards the millions. So do you know how that actually works in Spotify? How yeah. You have to know when you're a musician. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> you have to know, otherwise you'll always be broke. Uh, you have rights, right? The author's rights. When you write a song, uh, you can never give away that right. It's always yours. So before, when Spotify didn't exist, you could buy CDs or be played on the radio, and that would earn you a lot of money somehow. That That was the design. And now Spotify, yeah, this is very different. There weren't any rules about this. There weren't any agreements on this. So somehow they're not right yet, these agreements. So your author's rights, they will not make you a lot of money at all on the, on the internet or on Spotify. But there's also another uh, division in this thing. So there's rights and there's master royalties. And the master royalties are something the label, or if you released independently, uh, owns so the so the one hundred percent of master royalties is of the label and the label needs to divide that among their artists. So this means um, you have to sign contracts and you have to say no, I want five percent, no, I want ten percent, and then we just start and negotiating all these things. But yeah, you you have to make sure that you uh, are entitled to a certain percentage of this song. So whenever it starts starts to be successful, you will have a piece of the cake. Otherwise, you will just be left with your author's rights. And we already established that's not enough right now. So, yeah, the master royalties could still make you some money. And don't get me wrong. It's not like when you get a million plays, you're suddenly rich. No, not at all. It's really slowly. I think for a million plays, you can think there's going to be about 6,000 euros. So I don't know how many dollars that is, but so 6,000 euros. And that still has to be divided among the artists, the writers, the label, um, the label usually gets the biggest cut. So, you know, it is quite hard to still make <laughs> uh, thousands of euros. But, you know, once some people suddenly, I know people who suddenly had that hit 350 million plays on Spotify and on the radio and downloads on iTunes, suddenly this one song that you worked on for three afternoons or so. Mm. So this would, if you, ha- if you get this lucky, then somehow all your, the afternoons you worked and you weren't paid yeah. are paid. Interesting. You always were two steps ahead of everyone We'd walk behind while you would run I look up at your house And I can almost hear you shout down to me Where I always used to be And I miss you I'm so intrigued by this and uh, (laughs) I don't think I had what it took to become like a full-time artist as you know I'm I'm personally very into uh, art like drawing painting but Mm -hmm. um, what I've been doing is now basically waiting until my early 30s to say okay now I made enough money through corporate America working a (laughs) full-time job let's fund uh, podcasting or whatever that may be. And really yeah. it's not just podcasting, but just running my own business. Yeah. So it's fascinating. I, I must ask a question about uh, producers. I have been working as a project manager and producer for advertising, marketing, corporate America for the past 10 years. And now I'm freelancing, doing a lot of that as well. Now, music producers. So one thing I hear is, you hear people say is when an album performs really well, it's the musicians, uh, you know, or in this case, the singer's effort. When it doesn't perform well, 
or reach mm -hmm. the right audience, it's all the producer's fault. So <laughs> <laughs> people say that? Yeah, all the time. So I mean, oh, no. de depending on the situation, you know, same thing with films and all yeah, that. Yeah. So well, it's first of all, it needs to be good, of course. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, But, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It could be the producer, the singer, doesn't matter. Or it could be the promotion. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not it's quite hard to get everything in place to have it perfect, to have it, yeah, have it be a success. It can be arranged. I know what you mean. In a way, it's like I can never predict which episodes of mine will perform. In fact, some of the people who are introduced to me, they have such interesting story, but they're not mm -hmm. known at all. You know what I mean? Like they don't mm -hmm. have a large social following, but when they come out, it's like, you know, like the most recent episodes, I just didn't expect so many downloads, but it did. It's awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm really thrilled. I'm sure this one will yeah. do really well. I'm going to send it to Freiburg. Uh, Did this surprise you? Like with Riverbank and there was the other ones, um, Make Believe, you know, some of these really better performing songs, did this surprise you that they did versus some of the others that didn't? How do you mm. think about that? Yeah. Well, some, the ones that perform better, they're with DJs who are more, so they already have a bigger name for themselves. So uh, yeah, the, naturally the label will push those songs more promotionally. And the more, the smaller named DJs, Like myself, I'm a smaller named artist. <laughs> They'll push less. They'll they won't invest as much money in it. But I don't know. Sometimes when a song, when the A and R of the label will think this song's a hit, they will push it anyways, no matter how famous you are or how big your following is, because the label has a really big following. And actually, I don't just work with one label, but this is one label I have in mind that does this really well. Uh, yeah, a label, like a label in your clothing, they are a brand. And um, it's the same with music labels. When they're, when they're a good brand, they can have a big following. So, You know, I, I'm thinking maybe this is related to what your producer, what the producers and DJs and the collaborators you've worked with could contribute to your endeavor. Because I see all of you as a team, you know, working the same mission. You know, have you witnessed some people at your level kind of like, I wonder what does it take to kind of like pivot and kind of really take off in the music world? I sort of know that in, in the art world, but it's very ambiguous, if you know what I mean. Like there's no set mm -hmm. formula, step by step. No. Yeah. No. There isn't. No. Uh, yeah, it's about getting closer to the fire and working hard. And like for me, it's it's creating a really a lot of output. Like try to make the best product every time. Yeah, so there is a difference in songwriting for me as well. Before it was just Ming's Pretty Heroes was really my art and my baby, and it was like I was drawing my my biggest painting ever, or my you know per most personal painting ever. And then now I also write, taking into account the label, the DJs, the audience. But still not losing my own authenticity. I just, I need to be myself, but I also, I want people to listen to it. So I can't just, just be myself because then I would use weird sentences and weird words just because I like it, you know? And uh, right. <laughs> so th yeah, there's a difference in that. I guess you have to take into account the audience. Uh, you can find your way. You have to just have to be open for a lot of things and, and, and thinking solutions and You know, speaking of being yourself, where do you seek inspirations from these days? Or how do you kind of define your brand and becoming more fully of yourself? Because I find that process to be really fascinating, yet also daunting at times, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, it's it's about me because this is uh, this happens a lot, you know. Yeah, it's challenging, and um, yes, you're an entrepreneur, and sometimes you're just tired, or it just takes long before a release to come up again, so you'll get discouraged. This all happens, but it's about changing perspectives, really. For me, when I write, it's about changing perspectives. So as easily as easy as so. Wait, I'm writing from myself now, but what if I'm The other person in this song and I can change this perspective and, and see this story uh, from a whole different side. And so this is how you can break away from, from where you're stuck. And there are many different uh, ways to do this and you have to do them. <laughs> and, yeah. um, well, actually, how do you even treat feedback? Because I know you must have gotten some from listeners, from even friends and produ your producers. How do you filter them? In? Well, first of all, Some people are important and some not so much. <laughs> so the the important people, yeah, they will reject a song and then you'll just be 
like, bummer, we're just going to try to use this song for something else or that's all right. And I, my boyfriend, he's a dancer, modern dancer, but he really likes music. So he's always my ear back home. Like when I need an opinion, he always has good advice. So yeah, I think you seek out people to help you in that. And also before I used to write alone, like mostly, and since about a year and a half, I write to get, I collaborate with other songwriters. And so together you always take steps forward if it's a good soundboard, because Yeah, whenever I also work alone still, I record at home a lot. And then you can get stuck in, I don't know, is this good or is it bad or is it cheesy or does this work? And then it might be super awesome, but you just can't realize it at the time. So, or it can be really bad, but then. (laughs) And I think I forgot to mention one thing is that you also play instruments and I know you play the piano. You took lessons when you were growing up as a kid or? Yeah, I did that and I... I'm glad I did. And later on in in music school, I had to play as well. But I guess these are the basics. And I started playing more and more when I started teaching and writing. And now still every week through teaching, I play like 12 hours a week. So this is a lot. And I perform solo performances. I sometimes use the piano, but I don't see myself as a pianist or anything. I mean, I, I work with really awesome key players and they have this connection that I have with my voice. They have that with their fingers and their and their keyboard. And I cannot, I, I will not have this. So I can really use it as a tool and I can play songs and use it for writing. But I will never have that magical thing. <laughs> oh, you just <laughs> answered my it. question because I do think it's so much easier to have an instrument at hand as a songwriter. And it's kind of embarrassing. I, I played a couple of songs in high school, even though I wanna I wanted to sing, but I needed something at hand. Otherwise, I feel like I'll be so awkward. I would I would <laughs> yeah. you're so natural and like so relaxed on stage, I would just completely seize up. So it was mm. helpful to have like a guitar at hand, even though I, I learned one. One song just to play that otherwise oh, I don't awesome <laughs> it was amazing well Listen. actually for me it's more the other way around I mean I have played the piano and sang on stage many times and I'm still gonna do it but I get more nervous when I have to play because yeah because singing you can just this is yeah where what this is what I know and this is what I studied and yeah yeah absolutely well, this is uh, really fascinating. I, I know that I want to respect your time. I know you have a few things uh, lined up, but I want to talk about your upbringing, kind of your family uh, a little bit mm-hmm. too. And you had mentioned that, you know, you have a, you're a middle child, you have an older brother and younger sister. And I've seen uh, you spend a lot of time with your younger sister, at least a few years back and going to mm-hmm. music festivals. So what, what was it like growing up for you? Yeah, in Holland. Um. It was great. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm really close to my brother and my siblings and our family is pretty close as well. I guess it was quite careless. It was safe and uh, I got to go to really good schools and, and to do a lot of music and dancing, all these hobbies. And I actually got to become a musician, which is kind of, you know, special, especially since my, my dad, he was Chinese, but he... Um, he lived partly in Holland when he was young and partly in Indonesia. And when he came back from Indonesia to Holland, they were actually fugitives at the time. Oh, so, wow. yeah, they came here with nothing and four children. And uh, it's not a sad story, but it's a very interesting story. And I do kind of feel sad sometimes for my dad because he was so alone. <laughs> wow. He was 14 years old and no one would look after him. But, you know, they all did really well. They... They worked hard and they are Chinese, so they had to go to university and study and get diplomas. You know, this is very Chinese. And mm-hmm. so they did really well for themselves. And uh, this reflects it upon us, the children. I didn't have a care in the world and was free. So I became a musician, even though my brother, sister and all my nephews, they actually went to university and are all engineers and, and doctors and stuff. Really? <laughs> so, are you the only musician in your in your family? Yeah. Wow. I'm the only one who, who chose to do this yeah, more free um, occupation. And it's fine and they love it and they, and they, they go see, to see every show. But sometimes they would worry like, hey, don't you need more security? Or, you know, this is just built in. I think I took the turn, to the left turn a little soon for them. You know, it would have been easier if, they, if the next generation would start to become musicians and stuff. Well, I'm glad you I did know. what you did. I, I Yeah, I am a product of their, their hard work, really. <laughs> 
I didn't know that there were doctors and engineers. I mean, now you mention it, I feel like, and then given the sort of the rigid curriculum, uh, being in school in Holland, which I also mm. didn't realize before, that t- particular type of uh, educational system tends to generate people who are mo- more focused on the, you know, the math, the physics and the chemistry and the, uh, that whole nine yards. I think you've been very practical as well. I wasn't aware that you were mm. also teaching, you know, you're not, you're not exclusively uh, producing music at home without any additional income because mm-hmm. I think you've been very smart about that. And I think that particular aspect is very important, whether it's teaching in music. And I know that there are other musicians I know in New York who are doing something else during the day, such as photography, you know. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so before I let you go, what is your uh, what is your week like? You know, how... How you're kind of balancing your teaching, your writing music? So there's seven days. <laughs> <laughs> Performing on stage no, too. Yeah. No, I, I teach two days a week and this is um, partly because I like it, but I don't always like it. I would be lying if I, say, if I said I love teaching, you know? <laughs> so I do this t- two days a week from four to 10 on the Wednesdays and Tuesdays, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Whoa. And I do this at night because then during the day I can still work. So if I can, I will work from Monday to Friday during the days, during the evenings, uh, sometimes with people in sessions, we call it sessions, <laughs> or by myself. So a week ago, I had a lot of uh, songwriting sessions, so we had wrote a lot of songs. So this week, I have to record them. So I'm recording all week. It's kind of tiring sometimes, but <laughs> I'm finishing up all these songs, and then there's new projects coming in already, so... I'm just trying to stay on schedule most of the time. Are you and publishing? Try- when when can we find out about all the new music as you're recording them? Are they on Facebook or how do people follow you? Well, no, the, oh yeah, how do people follow me? You can follow me through Facebook, yeah, Minga. And uh, I have all the accounts on Instagram and Twitter. And But um, no, the songs I record, they are still uh, to be pitched to the publishers and to the labels. So it's, we are always just working and creating output and then it has to find its way still. So sometimes projects come in directly from producers and DJs or sometimes it's a pitch or sometimes, I don't know, I just start writing a song and I am, I present it to them like, this is my, <laughs> can you, do you know anyone who can work with this? Or sometimes you have writing camps and then it's for one special, uh, one particular artist and you write a whole week just for that artist. So so when they come to you, uh, the other way around feels like makes, you know, makes sense. But when they come to you, what are some of the requirements they ask you? Like, I want you to write this song or what mm-hmm. what, what, what do they tell you? Um, it depends. Right now I have a project from a producer in England and he, he has an instrumental and he needs, it's called a top line. So he needs songs and a melody and a, a voice. So he asked me to write, he asks me to write that. But I get a lot of these requests because people have instrumentals everywhere. So I also got strict. Like I only do it when I like it. I need, I need to have a fee for it. I need to, you know, I, and then we need to have an agreement already on the splits, the percentages, all these things. So first we talk business. It's kind of unromantic, but we, yeah, we talk business and then, I will start working on it and I can give an estimation of when I'll, I'll be able to hand in the first draft, the first demo. And um, when, Where did you learn all that skills? Uh, part of what you were describing is production, mm-hmm. like what a producer would do. Mm. Um, how, how do you, you know, the business aspect of things, where did you learn that? Like in real life, did you take a course? Uh, real life, <laughs> course of life. No, I also have a management and um, my manager and I work closely and he is the, he always does the negotiations and he reads the contracts, but I'm always part of the conversation. So I know what's up. Yeah. But you learn so much in real life, you know, and uh, it's so great to see you. You're so yes. adorable. Oh my God. Nice. You too. So nice to see you. Yeah. All right. Talk Bye-bye. to you soon. Bye. Hi there, it's me again. I want to thank you very much for listening to this episode and I hope you were able to learn a few things. If you enjoyed what you heard, it would be hugely helpful if you could subscribe to the Face Roll podcast. It literally takes seconds. If you're on your mobile phone, just search for Face Roll podcast in the podcast app on iPhone or an Android app such as Podcast Addict and click subscribe. All new episodes will be delivered to you automatically. 
Thanks so much for your support.